Welcome back. Um, Mal and I are going to rotate introducing folks. Uh, it's my really, really great pleasure to welcome Virginia Tassinari, who's flown in from Belgium, and Clive Dillnott, who's walked over from across the street. <laughs> um, yeah, far away from where? <laughs> Since you have their pro bios, I'm not going to do what um, Otto von Busch said is the long American, long-winded American introduction. You can read them. <laughs> I only want to say that I'm looking forward to hearing Virginia and Clive situate the symposium's proceedings within a history of ideas. Decidedly, a history, not the history. For them, design is a special kind of applied philosophy, not divorced from the world, but a means of engagement with it. Virginia and Clive, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Malgo, for organizing these days, and uh, thank you for giving me the possibility to share these thoughts with you uh, and to have this conversation uh, later on with Clive on this issue. So uh, basically, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, if we can look at uh, designers working in wounded places as uh, creating new possibilities. And for me, there is a question mark here. So it's really a discussion I want to engage with you today. I don't have a fixed uh, point of view on that. I just want to open up different perspectives. Um, so. Basically, we all know there are many designers at this moment around the world working in wounded places. And I like to think that Belgium is also, in many ways, a wounded place, like the context in which I work with my design students. Because we're wounded by uh, wild industrialization, we had coal industry, we had steel industry. Uh, many of these industries have closed down and left a huge amount of unemployment. Uh, we are in a very individualistic society. Uh, there's a huge disconnect between citizens and policymakers, getization. And I originally come from Italy, and these problems are even bigger in, in Italy than in Belgium. So I'm, I'm talking about wounded places, but Europe is full of this wounded places. And as designers, we are working with local communities and trying to see how can citizens be empowered uh, to act within this, uh, this, uh, these situations. And what we see is often that these wounded places, like for instance, the context of Serang, in which I've been working the past two years, um, a place of 41% unemployment, which is really huge for being Belgian. Um, th these are places uh, in, in which people can uh, be activated in a different way than in situations like, for instance, Brussels or uh, Antwerp. Uh, there are some problematics that have to do with, uh, uh, indeed, with unemployment, but also like on safety on street. Uh, there's uh, the disconnect between citizens and, and, and cities is really huge. Like, uh, I think it's even dangerous for people from the cities to go and, and speak with the people there. I think they would get like physical uh, you know, uh, confrontations. And uh, our experience is that uh, these wounded places really uh, are open uh, for designers to work with. Um, um, we like to think of ourselves that we create states of exception, like situations in which we make possible a positive change to take place, a positive change starting from people, eh, from people collaborating together. So as designers, we try to stimulate these collaborations and uh, uh, to, uh, to co-design and co-develop new initiatives together. And more and more we hear this word states of exception popping up also recently, uh, like when was it this last year when we were in Brighton Design Research Society Conference, we heard many times the word states of exception. But my question, is it really so? Um, and I, I really want to share with you my doubts also about my own work, because I've been working now two years in Serang, and I'm not sure that I'm really succeeding in creating a positive state of exception. And I think most of us working within local communities, uh, because it takes so long to see results, we are not really sure that we are really successful in what we are doing. 
Um, so basically, this is my question today. Are we designers working in creating state of exception in wooden places that truly succeed in creating a different kind of society in which citizens can make a difference? Are we just using rhetoric when we're saying this? Or is it true that we are really making a difference? And for replying to or trying to, to give some reply to this question, I go back to the definition of state of exception. And uh, the idea of state of exception, of course, we know Carl Smith introduced it but Giorgio Agamben made it more popular in the last years. Uh, this is the book he wrote, Lo Stato d'Eccezione, in 2003, and I think uh, most designers quoting states of exception today are, have not Carl Schmitt in mind, but uh, Giorgio Agamben. And what does Agamben mean by this idea of state of exception? He basically says that the state of exception is that which establishes the rule. It goes back to, Germ uh, so to Roman law. He says that the first ones to have of law, which are the Romans, uh, could institute the idea of law because they had this idea of almost satire. So basically a man that was outside of the law, so he could be killed by anybody without being punished. And because of that, the law could be established. So you see state of exceptions actually really a tricky concept. Because if we follow this definition of state of exception, it would mean that when we work in local communities to create state of exceptions in which citizens uh, can be empowered and then can take action within their own environment, actually we are working for sustaining the status quo eh, in a very involuntary way. So basically we are triggered by the status quo and we are doing a sort of social greenwashing. And myself, as a designer, I'm really scared of this. Uh, this is really like a challenge to me. And what I would try to see today, if, it's, if there is a pos positive possibility besides of that, is like, is our work in vain or do we have a hope? So is our work pure vanity or is there other possible ways to look at states of exceptions? So um, I like to start not from philosophy, but from the experience of working in these places, and start from the experience of the people involved within this initiative. So basically, ourselves, designers, but mostly the citizens. What we all experience, both designers as and citizens, is that we can find, again, pleasure in doing things together. I know that Ezio Manzini was here last week, so probably he heard this already, this story, but I'm sure he talked about relational goods, which is like trust, relationship, um, mutual collaboration. There are all things that in our Western society have mostly been forgotten, I think. And in these situations of exceptions, or in, for instance, what we call these cases of design for social innovation, we can, uh, we as designers, but also the citizens involved, we can all experience something unique, something different, like it's an aesthetic and uh, different kind of experience we have that working together give us a very different sense of satisfaction. Uh, if we go back to philosophy, the German philosopher Anna Arendt called this eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is the Greek word from which the word happiness derives. So basically this tells us that happiness in the beginning wasn't something belonging to the private sphere, but belonged to the public sphere. So I could be happy if I had a role within society, if my thinking and action would have a meaning within the common realm in which I was living. So basically, I can show who I am. So the diamond means the who, eh? so who I really am. I can show it by means of my thoughts, my actions, and my discourse together with the other citizens within the common realm. What I am, so the work I do, I can show it through my labor and my work, which uh, which takes place in the private sphere. And the word economics uh, comes from uh, oikonomia, which means home. So it's basically my work. And what Anna Haren says is, is that basically today we are all reduced to the what. We are all reduced to the private sphere. So we forgot what happiness means because happiness, the social happiness, belongs to the, pri to the public sphere. Only the other people can help me to see who I am. I cannot see it by my own. So it's just by means of my action and discourse, which 
for Anna Arendt are really connected in the public realm, that I can express my, at, at its fullest my human nature. And even the act of thinking, that I would think uh, as being trained as a philosopher, it's a very solitary thing, actually is a very public thing. I cannot think alone. I need other people, eh, like today, to think. Um, so basically the public has been cannibalized by the private and this has consequences. Mainly the fact that politics changed the meaning. Politics became a job. Uh, people are paid to be politicians. People uh, as uh, private interest uh, and uh, take, take care of others' private interests in the public sphere. And this is, according to Harland, the essential core of representative democracy. So politics has literally become economics, so something that has to do with the private sphere instead of the public sphere. And politics as such has disappeared. So this means that our human condition, which means to be public and private together, has been lost. We are just private humans. And Anna Haren says we are reduced to be animal laborants, so working animals. We are just part of the human race nowadays, and we lost our fully human condition. So this means that we do not have uh, real relation with other people. We don't have the ability to act and, uh, and, and, and have a discourse together with other people. It also means we cannot think anymore. We cannot be critical anymore. So we are a, a society of lonely people, and this is food for totalitarianism. So we, uh, the animal laborants, or the working animal, it feels superfluous, and that's why it, it can be trapped uh, into believing in uh, big ideologies and falling into the trap of, uh, of uh, uh, totalitarianism. But it feels superfluous because it, it, his judgment cannot count. His action does not find a common realm where to take place. It cannot really have a, a constructive discourse with other people. And that's why it feels superfluous towards society. It does not count. Um, this idea of the homo laborans or the animal laborans, it's a very univocal idea of humanity. So we feel we need to adjust because everybody's like that. Everybody needs to be working. Everybody needs to be thinking at his own business, mind his own business. Um, but because of that, we forgot that humanity is a plural uh, concept. And uh, so in, the, in, in this, you know, in this definition of the two different nature of man, the private and the public, Anna Arendt had very much into mind that the political nature of man, it's part of the human condition. So we are made of both. We need to work, we, did, we need to have a private sphere, but we also need to be, have a public sphere and to express the fact that we are zone politicon, so a political animal. Uh, but today we are continuously propelled by this idea of unilateral idea of humanity, of the homo laborans, and that's why it's so easy to be in solitude, it's uh, why it's so easy to feel superfluous, to feel that you cannot make a difference within your local context, the politicians are too far from you, and then it's much easier to fall into the trap of totalitarianism. So I really like this definition Anna Harent gives. She says, "No, not man, but men inhabit this planet. Plurality is the is the rule uh, or the law of the earth." And but she gives us a hope. She says, "This is the role of culture. This is the role of intellectuals that to remind ourselves that the idea of humanity is plural. To remind ourselves that people cannot be happy, that cannot find the eudaimonia, the happiness, as long as they are only busy with a private sphere, uh, as long as they are not active in the public real, and as long as they relegate the job of politics to." politicians. Uh, so how to recuperate the human condition at its fullest and allowing uh, people to experience what it means to like the human condition in, at its fullest. And this is the role of culture and I believe this is the role of, of design as well, be, belonging to culture today. Anna Haren says that these places in which it's possible to experience again the human condition at its fullest are oases. She doesn't call them states of exception. She said they are oases 
places where it's possible to experience other ways of being human beyond that of the homo laborans or the working animal. So how to prototype places in which it's possible again uh, to experience the human condition. So I really like to embrace this idea of oasis versus this uh, agambans idea of uh, states of exception. So it's not about uh, places um, which make us even more homo laborans, but it's about how to provide the possibility to experience with all your senses what it means to have this happiness, this eudaimonia. So basically, these oases are in between spaces where, again, politics is made possible. Politics in the original sense as action and discourse in the public realm, and not any longer seen as a job. So as designer, I would like to think that I'm working to create in this oasis uh, in which it's possible, again, to feel this uh, integral human condition, condition of private and public sphere. Uh, Arendt says that these in-between places are the only places in which politics is made possible. And I think in a moment we, in which we are all desperating all around the world about pol politics, uh, it's, it, it's, 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 it's important to think that there are other possible ways in which to create politics and our actions as designers can be seen as a political action. So if politics can only form in between people, uh, then it's also important to think about in terms of scales, right? Uh, the polis, uh, an Arendt says the polit politics uh, was coming up from the polis, or so from the city of Athens, but the city of Athens was 60,000 inhabitants, so it was a very small scale. It's like my city in Belgium. It's uh, super small, right? And this is the reason why it was possible to speak and to act together with other people, to take decisions together in the polis and to act accordingly uh, and uh, to be agonistic also in this uh, in this discussions it's not that we all need to agree but we recognize each other as being humans by doing this so the scale I think uh, if we think in terms of uh, projectual um, elements I think the scale is really important we can start again to exercise politics if we have a smaller scale uh, another element which I really like to to to, ha to take from Anna Harent is that she says that power comes from the people. I know it sounds very rhetoric, uh, but, but uh, I think it's really very different from the idea of power that we have today. Uh, she says power can only come in this discourse and action taking place amongst people in the common sphere in the police, so in a small scale. She says power is not something you can control. You cannot keep the power. It's like an energy that continuously transforms into something else. So when we design or we work as designer to empower people, when I say the word empower, there is the word power inside. So I, I, I help citizens and me as designer against other citizens to have again this power to have discourse and action with others. And I think this is an experience th that we are witnessing around the world uh, that cities today are really playing a major role. I'm thinking about uh, cities in Belgium at, with, with, with which I'm working, like the city of, of Seguin, but also the city of Antwerp is doing a lot. I'm speaking about the Netherlands, like the municipalities of the Nag, for instance. Uh, um, I'm speaking also about Italy, uh, more perhaps in the margins, more perhaps happening in Lecce than in Milan. Uh, but I'm, I'm speaking also about here, about your context. I know that cities here in, in the United States are really working very hard at this moment to have this idea of politics coming up. So many cities is something that we are seeing at this moment. Uh, and I like to think, of course, we cannot count perhaps on a federal level, but we can count in our, all, our local context. So as designers, it's very important, I think, to keep into mind that you're working in a small scale because you are trying to recreate these agoras, these conversations, these places. And perhaps it's easier to recreate the situations in wounded places because these places, they need it desperately. So wounded places in cities can be uh, seen metaphorically as a sort of lungs for cities, a sort of places that made it possible even more to have this discourses and action going around. Because people need it desperately, because they are looking for it, they're looking for a change. They do not trust politicians anymore, and that's why it's much easier to work with communities in wooded places than communities in places where everything works in a perfect way. But this also also means that these places are very fragile 
because if you work as a designer in these places and you promise things to people you cannot keep, you are doing something very bad. So we need to be very careful when working, in, of course, in this kind of situation. Uh, so by using the lenses of Anna Arendt, perhaps we can, we can see this situation as oasis, as small laboratories of, of social change where, where citizens are empowered to experience politics uh, once again. Uh, now, I introduce another philosopher, I apologize for this, but uh, George D. D. Uberman is a contemporary philosopher who's also very, very familiar with Anna Arendt. He considers himself as a scholar of Anna Arendt. And I like him because he's French, so he has a sort of melancholy <laughs> bringing <laughs> with his foot. So he's not triumphalistic. Eh? He says we need to create places despite everything. So, lieu uh, malgré tout means literally like places despite everything. So. Even in the worst possible situation, you can imagine you can help as an artist, as a designer, as an intellectual, to create the preconditions for this oasis to take place. And uh, I like Adid Uberman also because he speaks a lot about how places that have been wounded uh, uh, can uh, be reactivated also by means of memory, for instance, uh, artists working in, in, in wounded places. And he really has an attention on, on this uh, pluralistic idea of humanity, so how to, uh, to work as a designer and as an artist so that this idea of humanity is not flattered to the homo laborans to the working animal, but keeping in mind uh, that as, a, as, as intellectuals, we are really asked to, uh, to, to witness that humanity is plural. Um, and uh, so, he's, and of course, he says this in a much nicer way, as I'm saying, he speaks about poetic gaps that are opened, passages of survival made possible in the density of our present time. And um, in these places, so it's possible to experience a different idea of humanity and uh, uh, to experience that humanity is plural and there are other experiences, other aesthetics, other ways uh, that can give us again uh, eudaimonia, so a, a sense of happiness, a social happiness, and to rethink politics. Um, and this is something I really like to, to think that language can, can also help us in, 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 in opening up new perspectives. So perhaps these in-between spaces, these gaps, uh, these uh, wounded places can be places in which it's possible to rethink language. And of course, here there's a lot of philosophy. We could talk about Deleuze, uh, there's many different things. But I think this is really true. Like the word politics needs desperately to be rethinked. And, uh, Wounded places can be like a, a unique opportunity to, to rethink the idea of politics today. Um, and perhaps this is the only possible serious way to rethink at politics today. And um, so basically, you understand already that I'm not very sure we should use the expression states of exception. And I'm really curious to hear, Clive, uh, uh, your thoughts on that. Because I think it's a really a slippery concept. Uh, and perhaps we should uh, introduce more the use uh, of work oasis as uh, Anna Harent introduces. Or perhaps sh we should use the lieu malgré tout uh, as uh, Didi Urbaman introduced. Uh, just to stress the fact that uh, our aspiration is really not to strengthen the status quo but to try to uh, recreate the possibilities for uh, an idea of politics to rise uh, from citizens. And of course, we might be wrong. And of course, we cannot know if you really are doing a difference, if you are really empowering people to uh, this develop a new idea of politics. And that's why I go back to the malincholy of Didi Hubermans, because he speaks of an act of resistance malgré tout. So we don't know if we are effective, but we are humans. And uh, we, have the, we, have, we have the possibility to study, we have the possibility to develop self-criticality. Self so we have to resist to the flattering of the idea of humanity, to the homo laborans. So we have to resist even if perhaps we are wrong. Perhaps Agamben is right, and perhaps we are just working to establishing the status quo. But I think we, we need to be uh, slightly optimistic, eh? uh, not to be naive, but to keep this optimism that we are doing something that we think has a value. Perhaps it's not true, but we need to think that, I think. Um, so to co-design and co-produce Oasis, or Lie Malgretu in Wounded Places, is a beautiful and perhaps naive 
act of, resist act of resistance, malgré tout, in which humans can experience that there is an alternative to the homo laparans and that plurality is the law of the earth. And we need to resist. I think it's the only thing we can do. Uh, so I want to, to give you today this uh, positive view. And, but, but I also want to acknowledge that it might be that I'm totally wrong and that Agamben is absolutely true. So I'm, I'm curious to hear <laughs> Clive's ideas <laughs> on the state of exception. Great, thank you. Um, I was really relieved uh, when I um, saw a couple of days ago fr uh, from v Virginia the um, slides that she's shown you now because um, I, I actually love the fact that states of exceptions in the, the title and then almost vanishes. Um, I have a lot of skepticism about the notion of states of exceptions. It's not, this is not the place to actually ask a lot of questions about that except to say the biggest single problem, probably the biggest single problem, or at least one of them, is the oscillation that that notion has between um, sovereign power, which is politics, and then something which is outside politics. So we get, in a sense, the oscillation of um, Washington and um, 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 Occupy. If you, we get, in a sense, a, a, a brutal politics of power and a romantic and essentially um, useless politics of opposition when we think of it through that lens. And I want to sort of now kind of dissolve back from that lens and ask some kind of my, my I am um, skeptical uh, about the, uh, um, the, the, the political implications of that of the sort of pessimistic move which um, Agamben and others made in the late uh, 90s when the state of exception comes out. I would rather go back uh, myself to the um, uh, more optimistic um, Agamben of the little book um, Coming Community, which is much less recognized uh, from about 1990, I think, uh, where I think there is actually this structure of a, a much more interesting approach to both eth ethics, especially but by implication politics too. So I want to kind of ask some kind of question. What I'm really questioning is the politics of gesture in effect. Here. I'm, I'm enormously sympathetic to much of what uh, Virginia now said with um, Arendt. Um, and I'm, so I'm just kind of playing off this. This is no, no wise majorly of opinion. I'm taking here um, two or three, a uh, couple of concepts just to start us off here. And one of them is a notion that one of the problems of notions of state of exceptions, oases, and so on, is that these are places. Um, the, which have to be removed from the world in order that one can reconstruct these political and cultural um, moments. Yet it seems to me that, on the contrary, what we might need to think about is that politics and justice does not happen, as it were, in the future, but is, the, is, the, is not just an objective of action, that which is over there, but which is its um, axiom. And I take this, and I'm reading this through a politics as design lens now, meaning the design of politics, in a sense, just as much as I mean the design. But you'll also see in a second that I want to give it this material twist as well. That very much linked to this notion of the axiomatic is this notion of the, of the uh, notion of the all, uh, this is Gillian Rose, not Gillian Rise, that's my typing, my apologies. Um, the late English philosopher who wrote one of the great little books, I think, on uh, contemporary ethics in Morning Becomes the Law. This beautiful quotation here, to take acting politics does not happen when you act on behalf of your own damaged good, but when you act without guarantee for the good of all to take the risk of universal interest. These two things come together to me and added, and this is the design component, with a third principle, that of the prototype, or the, rather the necessity to, to create that which can become stereotype. And this is the difference, I think, between pure states of exception, which happen over here and are not necessarily 
prototypical of the larger. What as I'm saying, there is an urgency in politics to be able to move from prototype to stereotype, to be able to universalize indeed, not as it were to keep things, the alternative things within a private sphere. And my instance, let me give you a concrete instance rather than a philosophy. Here is a poster by Abraham Gaines. It's um, a British poster designer from 90, this is 1943, uh, done for the um, war effort in, this is middle of World, World War II, this is to rally um, the, uh, the, the home populace and the, the implication of a future for Britain, this little building which is unidentified but which would have actually been known, I will show you in a second, behind it is speaking what looks like the bomb kind of ruins of a slum and the child there, you can see the very thin child is suffering from a rickets, which is a disease of malnutrition which in 1930s Britain was still prevalent in slum areas. So here's the poster. What does the poster represent? What does it, how would you have read it? This is its origin. This is Finns Finsbury Health, Health Centre, London, in 1938. It's the first real modern public health centre uh, done by the borough of um, Finsbury in um, London deliberately uh, designed in the modern manner, uh, Bertold uh, Betkin, uh, a rather beautiful building. Its aspirations are clear from this little um, sort of sketch, public sketch. Looks wonderfully sort of naive from our point of view, but it gets across its point. It, an air of efficiency that gives confidence to the patients. This is modern, modernism's great hope, of course. But it was a reality, too. Let's not forget it. This is, you're in the middle of working-class London. This is better than anything you can get at that time. Let me be assured of you. And it is addressed to all. This is not a private health centre, just to remind you. This is a, a public health centre. And it's still in existence, it's still popular. <coughs> Why then the poster? What does the poster do? Well, the poster is read, would have been read immediately, as in fact, aiming, I mean, there's a version with the title actually on. Known after publicity for the um, welfare state in Britain as a direct potential anticipation of the National Health Service. So they, literally, the Finsbury Health Centre is prototypical of, a sense, sense, a universal model. Very interesting that this poster was personally banned by Winston Churchill. <laughs> Churchill banned it on the grounds that most Englishmen do not live in slums, and therefore this was counted. He did, that was clearly not the reason. Churchill knew as anybody, clear as anybody, that this was redolent. This was speaking to the future of a national health service. So this notion of the prototype and how we actually think of the prototype and that, that which is the product of work in the OACs. A second example of this would be somebody like Brian Bell, who architect um, down in... North Carolina, who has more or less devoted himself in the, since the 1990s to attempting to improve, this is Brian Bell here, housing for migrant um, farm workers in the South especially. What Brian Bell is reacting against are conditions like this. These are all on current websites for um, migrant housing some of which scarcely qualifies as housing, even in the most primitive sense, but, and about at best you get the, the um, tar paper shack, as it were. Bell is in, insistent that things could be other, that they could be done other. Now, I think this is clearly, in the first instance, the health centre, the wound here, was in fact all the health wounds attending around um, 
in a sense, a slum or a working class population in London in the 1930s. Here, the wound is on the conditions of being a migrant um, um, farm laborer with all the politics that that now uh, ensures. Now, I think there are three vital aspects of Bell's project, and which also refer back to, uh, um, to the um, Finsbury uh, project, too. One is this notion of inclusivity. And I, I'm t you, using Alice Crary's recent book here on um, inside ethics with the implicit argument of, of that book is the necessity to think of um, ethics as inclusive and of subjects as inclusive to ethics, including, in her case, animal rights and subjects outside of how we think of subjects. So the notion of inclusivity of, again, addressing all is extremely important. A second ethic, which I think Bell um, is speaking to, and I think in some ways um, the previous project too, this is um, Badieu's ethics of the situation pulled out of one page in his uh, great little polyemic volume, um, Ethics. And I think this is uh, a superb uh, um, ethical proposition and a superb uh, identification, I think, of the ethics of d design, too. Because we, the notion that this is, that we address concrete situations and we push them to the limit of the possible, meaning the limit of the ethical possible, to draw from the situation to the greatest possible extent the affirmative humanity that it contains. And I think there's just no better prescription for what ethical. The third point comes out of here that probably uh, is hard for you to read, but the very first line uh, of this presentation for the notion of a cultural village for migrant workers, which says, each year thousands of migrant workers come to our state to work in farms. Picket. It's the notion of really what Bell is saying, without being explicit about it, is dependency. That we are actually, we, the American economy, especially the, the agricultural economy, is completely dependent on migrant workers. There was a wonderful little piece in the Times a few weeks ago saying they were talking to some people uh, in a small town in the Central um, uh, Valley in California who um, were actually beginning to get very worried by Trump's immigration policies even though they had voted for Trump. We didn't think he would be serious about removing immigrants. We need them. <laughs> it's beautiful. So dependency. <laughs> these notions here seems to be important. Now, where I think these are important is like this. Look, once we, once, if we simply see Bell's projects as kind of reparative, I don't, we don't, in a sense, see their force. I think their force can be comprehended through another quotation from Badia. This is me. Um, as usual, um, taking by the, and in this case, kind of adapting his quotation. This is also pulled uh, from his book on ethics, but I'm twisting it now a little bit for my own. But Badia's argument that the event, this lovely argument, that the event is both situated and supplementary, that what an event is, my translation, is that which speaks to the situation, but in the same moment launches thought beyond the limits and rules of that s situation. I would argue that in different kind of ways, both the Finsbury Health Center in its context, Bell in our context, do that. One of the deficiencies we have is that we actually fail to pick up that very last point. Mm -hmm. What are the concepts buried within Bell's propositions that take thought beyond the limits of thought, <laughs> philosophical, political, ethical, and so, so on? Now, this links to a third point, because I think, in effect, that Bell is doing what Brecht asked us to do. There's a great line from Brecht, and I can't find where I found this line, so it's disappeared. <laughs> I've got it on my computer. I, I looked today, and um, Google wouldn't give it to me, so maybe I've invented it. But either I invented it, or Brecht once said it somewhere. 
but it's a beautiful line and I, it's too good to not use. So <laughs> to this notion that we link our prototypical propositions to the idea of diagnosis so that we can. And where I can give you an instance of this is my um, absolute, <laughs> I'm going to say a stupid thing now, my all-time favorite Holocaust m memorial, which one should not say. Um, <laughs> what I mean by that is the memorial which I think thinks. Uh, I, let me put it this way. Um, this is Places of Remembrance in Berlin. Um, it came out of a historical project that was done uh, in the suburb of Berlin, which had previously been a, 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 a very heavily Jewish neighborhood, about 17,000 people in it. Um, they did a local history project recovering some of that. The end of it, they wanted a memorial. Um, and two artists, um, artist, sorry, and art historian, René Tischti and Friedrich Schnock, submitted an extraordinary proposal. This is what you see. And what was even more amazing, it was accepted and is realized. This is what you see. You will go into the area and you suddenly see these painted signs, or printed signs, sorry, um, about three meters off the ground. And there are 80 of these in the neighborhood. And so you confront them. And they were done in this peculiar, what I must call almost sort of child's primer style. They're almost art and anti-art. They're almost anti-art. You see them, you wonder what on earth they're doing, and you begin only to pick up that there is something going on here when you look at the back of the poster. What each of these posters, uh, which we can call them posters just for the sake of it, signs refer to are the... Um, some of the rules and regulations which were applied to the Jewish population between 1933 and 1942 when they were finally expelled. And you can see this notion of the signs going across. There are about every 100, 200 um, meters or so, you can see two of them there. I must have been four times, five times to this. I've never seen all of them. There are times you went where you think that they're kind of going on and on and on th through the city, which is rather wonderful in a way when you think about it. In a way, they ought to be across the entirety of Germany, of course. These, these, I think, are brilliant. Just to give you, this one says, Jews may, 1940, may only buy bread between 4 and 5 in the afternoon. They all refer, nearly every sign refers to a material um, object, which is itself interesting. This one, jewelry, I can read it, made of Items made of gold, silver, or platinum and pearls belonging to Jews are to be turned to the state, 1939. They go, these all deal with tiny moments. I'll try and finish. 1936, this is the um, occasion of the Olympics. 1942, Jews may lo no longer have household pets. You, you get the picture. Now, what, what I think is so vital about these, and this is the, where I'm going to kind of end this now, is this last quotation, again, adapted from Zizek, where uh, what I think this work is doing as a memoir is not passive to the idea of the Holocaust, which I would say even works like kind of um, um, Eisenman's work, but is actually active. And this quotation that comes from Zizek, the top line is the important one. However, what about the retroactivity of a gesture which reconstitutes the past itself? This is, perhaps, he says, the most succinct definition of what a, the authentic act is. In our ordinary activity, we effectively just follow the coordinates of our identity. An act proper is the paradox of an actual move which not only changes the actuality of our world, as conventional design does, but retroactively changes the transcendental coordinates of its agent's being. Such acts offer a reflexive folding back onto the condition that gave rise to it. In this process, fate, here the Holocaust, in my view, becomes not predestination, but decision, i.e. politics. That is to say, one moves it back from the inevitable, the given, one moves it back into a political context. 
So I've tried to kind of widen out, well, I don't know whether I've widened out or narrowed the concept of oases, probably both at the, the, the same time in a way here. But I, all this goes on to say is that this is an enormously fertile field, I think, for us to, to define. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Oh, we have a dilemma. We were hoping to have a little conversation. I guess we have about 10 minutes, so we'll just push everything back a bit. We can't just let this opportunity pass. So Clive and Virginia, please do take the stage. And I guess the question I would ask Virginia is how do you respond to, do you want to sit up front or no? Helpful. I'll turn the light on. Um, Oasis is an idea. I mean, I was a little confused. Oasis and in between. I, I know you were using them differently, um, but Oasis seems hermetic, and what Clive was describing seemed more coming into the world. Is your point that you need the Oasis to come into the world? In other words, the work done in the Oasis is going to exclude energy that will leak out, that it will stay in the oasis. Can you explain what you mean? Okay. Um, when I hear oasis, I think of palm trees surrounded by desert. I think of literally. <laughs> so the palm trees here are the intellectual, the ideas of culture, the possibility, and the desert is that which would flatten us. Mm -hmm. If designers and artists work in oases, how do we, how does that change the flattening around us? Does it leak out? I'm asking you, Virginia, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm thinking that oasis yeah. uh, somehow, uh, let us think as a utopia. And uh, this is a bit tricky, of course. That's why nobody uses the word oasis, we use the word states of exception because it gives more the idea of a situation in which something can happen and be generative. Generative, that's what I'm looking for. Yes, yes, yes. While, yeah. Yeah, sorry. While the idea of oasis let me think immediately at a utopic situation or like something like a, like dreamy-like. Uh, so I think this is the reason why nobody's using the word oasis, but we kind of like to use the word states of exception. And uh, in a sense, I'm not sure I won't use it any longer because uh, it, it, it immediately gives you know, the feeling what we were talking about, but I just think it's a very slippery concept because if you look into Agamben's philosophy, it kind of gets scary. Uh, so that was a bit like, like my question today, like how could we describe them? Uh, I'm perfectly uh, aware of the fact that Oasis is a, is, is, gives also a wrong image somehow. Um, perhaps the lieu malgré tout, Somehow, it's it's a sort of of of, of definition I like. Yeah. yeah, I'm not so sure because you know one. I don't see how one moves forward without these um, utopic models in some way. Now the mm -hmm. problem seems to me that I mean the political problem seems to be in the last twenty or thirty years that the utopic models have got smaller and smaller. They've become sort of community politics, I say. I mean, I'm now doing a caricature, mm -hmm. but I read somewhere that somebody was saying there was more than 100,000 projects across the world around sustainability. And unfortunately, 100,000 projects have been like a hill of beans, you know, they amounted to zero. This is a problem. So in a sense, projects by themselves and shrunken projects I, I would, I'm now going to have a, a slight go at sort of the community idea, uh, only because I think it's got, it has a little bit too much power now. The question seems to be, to be, mm -hmm. uh, as with the Finsbury Park Health Centre, how one relates the utopic moment to its potential expansion, mm -hmm. to its universalization. Mm -hmm. And I think to some extent we, we, are, we collectively, I've had a fear of universalization. So we do lots of little community projects. I would love us to have you know, a project on uh, a whole postgraduate program on big design, you know, 
world <laughs> design. I mean, I think we kind of, in certain sense, we need that. So, I, but we need the mm -hmm. oasis moment. So it's how do, how do we relate mm -hmm. those two? Without yeah. the concretization of what could be, then we're arguing for empty yeah. promises. Yeah. Or, yeah. like in, um, as in Trump, one has to go backwards. Trump is promising a kind of retrospective utopia as part of his power, but that retrospective utopia has a kind of mythic concreteness. It's mm -hmm. mythic, but it's kind of real on another level. Um, without, so without the concrete, we are powerless. Um, the models by themselves uh, are equally powerless, we are finding less powerful than we thought 10 years ago when we thought of a proliferation. Mm -hmm. Ezio Manzini was mm -hmm. built a whole kind of notions of network on that, perfectly reasonable in a sense. It was a f perfectly fine hope, but it hasn't worked. So moments of, yeah, how do we put the big and the small? Yes, I think the, 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 this issue of the scale, it's really important. Um, and uh, somehow, I, 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 I think in my slides presentation, perhaps it was really presented like a dichotomy between like cities and federal government. But to me, it's really like a question how to, to, to do not create dichotomies, uh, but to try to create connections and to create bridges. And uh, it's a whole discussion we have also with design activism. I mean, I, I totally agree with many of those actions and some of the things we do could probably be described as design activism. But I think you need to be propositive as well and to try to create bridges uh, between this oasis, uh, this lie uh, malgré tout, and between the life we are, we are leading each day. Um, and I think it's really complicated. And I think probably we need to work as designers, but together with other disciplines, uh, and to have moments like this, <laughs> laboratories of thought, in which can, we can really make sense of the work we are doing and try to understand which are the best strategies possible in order to create these uh, this bridges and to see like, how to connect the scales, which is absolutely necessary right now. Simone's essay, Cities of, Ins of Uncertainty, where the oasis, if you understand it as ecology, is not actually an island in an exception. It is actually an ecotone. It is actually there and very stereotypical. It's very reproductive. And in fact, if you have the same phenomena, you can have many of them. And it is axiomatic. And I think the problem is we're still binaries. And you're talking about a ternary kind of system where the situation and temporality are working, and that you're going into the most, uh, the, the meso level is the most complex, and it's the most disruptive, it's the most turbulent. And I think we've been always talking about the between, the sort of between the middle of power, big and small. And so I, I, I would argue that, that we have to, again, in the language, we're finding, we're having a conversation that's still binary, and that there is a much richer understanding of the conflict within it, as Keller Easterly writes in Extra Statecraft, where we're not looking at the active form, um, that we are still uh, representing the form of the activity, and that we're not actually in, in the midst of the hands-on dialing of the form. And so I, I think what you're both getting at has to become deeper. But the solutions still sort of remain on amending the object, rather than changing the flow. And I think that has that is where we have to get out of that line. I wouldn't disagree with any of that. I think I would agree, you know, yeah. I think the, the more and more and more the binary moments will worry me. Uh, more and more and more the notion of being able to, I would say, reconfigure, reattune the infrastructural systems which we depend on, so on and so forth. These being the true networks which we kind of want, which which we would um, want to kind of get hold of mm -hmm. going right. forward, um, in order to be able to create a more humane world. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's where I would say the reading of Okio is, is private is incorrect. I think it's too narrow. I think Okio is household. 
And when I do it, one thing I will pick up on that conversation which links to the economy is in fact the, the necessity to link much more to notions of the economy. Exactly. So the moment mm -hmm. we pull out, if mm -hmm. you like, the household, we either privatize it or in some ways, and within the, the design sphere we do this really, and yet really what we are actually concerned with now is actually making really, in the end, models of a different economy and other or economy. An actual economy. Yes, an actual economy. <laughs> yes, well, a no, real economy. As not, the, the not, one. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, no, I think that's definitely the you know, that's the fun in the future, if yeah. you like. I think that's also the point of Anna Hart, and it's part of yeah. the human condition, right? But if it's just reduced to that, you, you lose something. And, and, and perhaps we should just go back to the scale of each human. If you experience one of these situations of oasis in which you can have access again to both the, the economic, to the oikonomia, the house, both the polis or the agora, <laughs> then perhaps the situation can be generative, can change society because we experience in a personal level what this means. And I think in this moment in, in Europe, we are really touched uh, by all this wave of people coming from, from the south of the world. And perhaps we feel it even much more, the fact that we need to understand what's our humanity, what, what, what makes us happy really, and what can change society there. You know, like what can co what can we contribute as citizens in changing society, in in, in experiencing ourselves, what it means? Well, maybe they're not refugees, but households. Yes, indeed. With that, I want to say thank you, and thank you for correcting my primitive translation of always. No, 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 no. It helped. <laughs> no, thank you very much. To be continued.